yeah, I'm very anxious and excited and I don't know, I'm feeling everything at once. Yeah. Oh, I can see. Yeah. Anyways, so yeah, I've been I've been thinking a lot about getting well not getting upgrading my PC. And mm -hmm. you have a PS4? Uh, yeah, I have a PS4. Is your mic working? I think you need to turn your mic. Wow. Okay. Is your is Kayla's mic working? Hello. I think so. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, like when the PS5 first came out, like it blew up and everybody was getting it. And same for like the new graphics card thing. I don't know the name. The 30 series. The 30. Yeah. But I have an Xbox One that I haven't touched in like two or three years. And then, yeah, when PS5 came out, it got me excited. But then, yeah. I never ended up touching it again. Yes, you should sell it. Give it away. You should sell the Xbox One, say brand new. <laughs> I don't know. I spent too much money on it to just, you know, throw it away. You know? You can just sell it. True. What games? Um, I don't know. It's mostly just one game, and then I just kept buying, like, add-ons to that same game. Wait, what game? Destiny. Oh, Destiny. Dude, that was, yeah, that was a long time ago when I was in, like, middle school. I spent so much money on that game. How dude, much? That game was such a scam, dude. Like, to play it, you needed, you needed to, like, buy, buy features in order to play the game after you bought the game. It's called DLCs, man. Yeah. No, I haven't played that game in, in a long time. But, yeah, you buy the game... And then they make you pay to play the game even more. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Oh, there's babies. Oh, yeah. Hajin, what's your favorite game? What's my Which favorite game? Uh, oh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of babies running around. Just say it, bro. Interesting. My favorite game? It's hard to decide. I don't know, Minecraft? Minecraft. I've been playing a little bit of Minecraft recently. What about you? You guys oh. like? Me? Baby. Is that a game? Oh. Yeah. You get new devices during this quarantine? Devices? Oh, yeah. What? Guys, Samsung or Apple? You guys prefer which one? Which one is better? Wait, what phone do you have, Caleb? 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 Yeah, but there's two Caleb's right here. Caleb has Apple, and then the other Caleb has Samsung. No, no, no. Or I have Android. a Google phone. Google phone? Okay. I have, oh, that's a cool symbol, the Apple symbol, Apple. Apple. Yeah, I have an Apple phone. I don't know, I have a 7, so it's like. Samsung gets a win for the VTS collab. Their phones are better. <laughs> what? Wasn't that phone, like, banned or something? I saw a YouTube video on it. It was, why, I don't know, there's something, the there's some, some, like, controversy over it. No? Have okay, you, maybe, what? I don't know. What? I saw something about that, the BTS phone. You got clickbaited. Question mark. Faith Feature is questioning me. Yeah. Dude, I really want to upgrade my iPhone phone, but I just don't have the money. I've had the same one since, yeah, it's the same one from since the first phone I got, the iPhone 7. It's not that bad, but it's not, you know. The best. Yeah. My phone cracked. Oof. Well, well, iPhone 5. IPhone 5. Wait, do those still work? iPhone 5? Dude, that came out when I, I was in like elementary school. It's like half a decade ago. Yeah. Tim teacher? Wait, Pete Tim? Okay, apparently Pete Tim had the iPhone 5 as well when he was... A sophomore. In high school. Sophomore in high school. Dang. That's kind of... Now, now, I feel kind of old. But yeah. You feel kind of old? Yeah, I had to get my phone replaced three times. Like, within like a few months when I first got it. Because first it got wet, and then the replacement they gave me was defective, so I had to get that replaced again. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't free. It cost money. 
loved Apple. Yeah, and I've had the same case for like four years. It's all beaten up. Nice. Time. Yeah. Anyways, for this week's announcements, Caleb, would you like to Oh uh, yes. Tell so us news? we have Wednesday night prayer on Wednesdays, of course. But we do not have any link night on Saturdays. And then of course Easter Sundays sign ups are still open. And uh there will also we will also be selling our link hats there for twenty five dollars. Like yeah, as always. So bring some money. And uh the junior, senior. Confirmation baptism. Oh, yeah, confirmation baptism sign up, and it's on April 18th, I think. And, yeah. Oh, and also for the Easter Sunday sign ups, for those of you who plan on signing up, there's a question on the form that asks if you're bringing family or siblings. Wait, same, okay, family or friends. Family or friends. Um, if you do fill out that question, Please make sure that the person you included in that question also fills out their own form. Yeah, so if you're saying you're coming with your brother, uh, have your brother also sign up with his own form. Yeah, it makes it easier to keep track of who's coming. So, yeah, if you haven't signed up, a uh, strong reminder to sign up so we know who's coming. We're all very excited to see you, everyone there. Yeah, so please <gasps> welcome up P. Dan for oh, a time of prayer. prayer. All right, good morning, uh, Link. Uh, we're gonna go into a time of prayer um, today um, for our service. Uh, today we have the privilege of being able to hear Pastor Ken from ALC, our EM pastor. Um, he'll be giving our word today, and so I'll be leading us in our opening prayer. Um, you know, for our, our opening prayer today, Before we pray for our service, um, you know, I feel the need to um, just briefly uh, just address uh, the, the tragedy and the evil that, that happened this past weekend. Um, and, and I know that by now you guys have seen all sorts of different um, things on social media or even on the news about um, about the evil in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and for the victims and for the, the perpetrator. And, and I know right now it's confusing times, it's anxious times, um, it's also very angry times um, for our Asian American community, our Asian community. know whatever reasoning this guy had to to create such evil it, it, it breaks my heart that that such evil would occur whatever the reasoning behind it was for him it was it was evil and it was devastating Just what's going on in, in, in our nation it's it's difficult to comprehend and to understand and so what what I want my, my prayer for you guys church is that we would learn to have uh, a, a gospel response in this to see the, the evil and the darkness through the lens of Christ because if we can do that even in spite of the evil and the darkness there is hope in, in Jesus not just the racism but even 
the way that this dude called himself a, a, a church grower, a goer. I, I, I grieve, right, the, the gross misappropriation of faith and scripture and of God. The irony of expensing the other person's blood and not their own, right? Hebrews 4.12, it says that you have not, you have not avoided temptation to the point of bloodshed. Oh, man, I grieve that. I grieve the loss, and, and, I, and I grieve the gross misrepresentation of the gospel. In John 9, it says that if anyone follows me, they, they know that, that I'm someone who's willing to lay my life down for the other. And, and what I'm seeing in this world is people trying to trample on one another, people trying to one-up another. Even in the church, it's because we, we're not seeing this through the lens of the Good Shepherd. We're seeing it in, in, in just in our anger and in our frustration. And, and I'm not saying let's not be angry. I'm not saying let's not lift up our voice. But we have to stand firm on the gospel. We have to stand firm on the, the, the truth of Jesus. Who says that if anyone would follow him, they would lay their life down. doesn't mean to just throw it away, but it means to invite the presence of God to live in me and to live through me. So right now, let's pray for a moment before we pray for our church and our ministry. Let's pray right now for our nation, for the heart of reconciliation right now. Between different ethnicities, different people groups. Let's pray for the reconciliation of that. Let's pray right now for, for healing upon our nation. That as people of God, as salt and as light, as bringers of hope, we would be the ones who bring the unity by the blood of Jesus. So let's take a moment and let's lift up our nation right now in this time. Let's specifically lift up also our Asian community who's experiencing pain. But we don't do that at the expense of other people. And so we lift up all who are hurting, all who are brokenhearted in this time. So let's take a moment, let's lift up our nation right now, and then we'll pray for a couple more things. Let's pray, church.
beautiful things about Jesus is is that yeah he 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 died on the cross and he resurrected so that we can have life and life to the fullest but one of the ama- another amazing thing that he does is is that 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 invites us it, it, it gives us an invitation to now partner with him for the kingdom of God to come and manifest itself in this world. That's one of the, the, the beauty of being able to follow Jesus is that we don't just get this get out of hell free card, but he invites us now to partner with him, to work with him, to be ministers of reconciliation. And so let's pray right now for our church, the church, not just Link, not just AOC, not just San Diego, KUMC, but the church. Let's pray, God, help me to stand. Help me to realize that the covenant that you've made with me was a call to be salt and light to this world to be ministers of reconciliation with my brothers and with my sisters of different color and background and ethnicity. And so church, it's it's time for us to follow Christ and to follow the gospel. Stop following trends that you see. Stop following just just the, the, the media and what social media is posting time we stand with Jesus because Jesus stands for all who are weary, all who are broken all who are burdened and he calls us to be light to them and so let's pray for that, that God I want to be empowered not because the world tells me but because the gospel that brought me life and brought me hope calls me to do so So let's just pray for that. Holy Spirit, would you fill me so that I would stand for righteousness, that I would stand for justice, that I would stand for for those who are hurting right now. And so let's pray for that. Let's pray that one of the things that I shared on Wednesday was that for a lot of us, church is like going to the museum, right, to muse at paintings. But God has called us to be painters, not just observers. And that's the beautiful thing that he calls us into in that relationship with him is that he doesn't just call us to come and and just look at stuff and just be amused by it, but he calls us, hey, now you paint. Now you be a part of this, this redemption work that I'm doing. And so if you want to be a part of that, let's, let's pray, Holy Spirit, fill me that I may be used by you. And so let's take a moment, let's lift that up. Let's be people who can stand with the gospel to bring hope into this world. Let's pray, let's pray, let's lift that up.
Jesus, we just, God, we lift up, Lord, those who have been so devastated, Lord, by the, the evil that happened this past week. God, we know that your heart grieves it. We know that also in light of the deep chaos and the deep evil, Lord, you give us time to lament and you give us time to, to be sad. But Lord, you don't do that without giving us the hope, the hope of glory that is in you, Jesus. God, even though it's not fully here yet, Lord, we know and we believe that it is coming, God. Lord, that's why we gather on Sundays, Lord, to stand, God, and to declare your victory, God, even in the midst of the storm, God, even in the midst of the chaos, Lord, that we can stand and we can worship you, God, because that grave is empty. Lord, death no longer has its sting. Lord, sin, even if though its presence remains, the power no longer keeps us captive. God, that's why we can stand and we can worship you. That's why we can stand, Lord, and still declare your name, God, because the story is not over. God, we lift your name right now on behalf of all of the communities that are hurting, God. On behalf of all of those who are brokenhearted, God, we lift them up right now. And we come to worship you. God, we will not shrink back in the face of evil. But Lord, we will sing louder. God, we will hope harder. And God, we will pray more so that your kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Jesus, we give this day to you. We thank you, Lord. And we worship you today. And it's in your name we pray.
that song I'm going to sing is Freedom Reigns. And um, yeah, the first line of the song, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Um, it's, it's taken straight from scripture. And it's just like God's promise to us where, um, yeah, wherever his spirit goes, wherever his spirit um, like falls, um, there's freedom that comes with it. And um, yeah, biblical freedom that comes with it. And, yeah, the thing is that, um, yeah, like, we're given, like, the, this gift and this grace where we can, you know, we can invite God's spirit and his presence into wherever we are, like, in our own rooms or, um, you know, if we're all here at church, like, it doesn't matter. And, yeah, before we sing this, let's just take some time to... Yeah, really just invite his spirit here. Um, and uh, yeah, just remind yourself of this promise that, um, yeah, he gives us that. Um, yeah, wherever he goes, wherever his spirit falls, um, there's going to be um, freedom that comes with it. So yeah, let's just spend some time in prayer.
Yeah, Jesus, we give our all to you. Because as we have sung, God, when we give our all to you, there is freedom. Lord, we are often too easily pleased and satisfied with the things of this world, God. There is no freedom like the freedom that you give to us, God. Lord, there is nothing greater. There is no greater thing we can do than to give our all to you, God. Give us that kind of heavenly perspective so that the things of this world would grow strangely dim and that we would know the beauty of following you, God. Be with us, Jesus, in this time. We love you, and in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, Link Ministry, um, we have... A special privilege today. Um, for some of you guys who already know Sophia, Lizzie, and Shane from our ministry and maybe small group or ministry teams, um, we have the wonderful privilege of having um, Pastor Ken Rowe, um, our new ALC um, pastor, coming here to give us a word today. And so, um, yeah, I mean, you guys are on the Zoom, and so I don't know, throw clapping emojis up, I guess, as we welcome up um, Pastor Ken. Um, up here for the Word of God today. And so, Pastor Ken. Am I on? Okay. Thank you, Thank you Pastor Dan. I'm just blown away, blown away by the worship team. Um, just... Uh, the, the quality of, of worship, you guys, oh my goodness, you guys are so blessed. And we praise the Lord uh, for that, that time. Uh, well, good morning. Is it still morning or is it afternoon now? It's afternoon, <laughs> good afternoon. Link, uh, as Pastor Dan said, my name is uh, Pastor Ken Rowe. I am the new lead pastor of ALC. Uh, by new, I mean nine months new. Is that still new? <laughs> At least in the, when, you have a, when you get a new phone, when you have it for nine months, that's not new, is it? Uh, already another one's coming out. So I don't know if, I, if I'm considered new still. Um, but we are in a, a weird time right now, aren't we? And I met some of you already in person. Uh, I met the Caleb's. Uh, the Josephs, the Noahs, the Joshes, um, and the Natalie, and Sarah, I met this morning. And uh, to tell you the truth, there's still a bunch of ALC folks I haven't met yet. <laughs> and I've been here for nine months. Well, that's definitely weird, isn't it? I'm like uh, an internet pastor right now to many of our ALC uh, pastor, uh, people. Well, I think we're close. We're, we are close, and uh, I am really looking forward to meeting uh, each of you in person very soon, okay? Can I also briefly just say that you are indeed, I mean, I just, just so many different ways that, that I think don't know if you guys know how blessed you are. You know, the worship team is just, just, just so awesome. But you guys are also very blessed to have the pastors that you do in Pastor Dan and Pastor Tim. Not just because they're handsome, which they are, um, but because of their love for Jesus and their love for you. And from what I can see, it's real, authentic. 
You know, it takes a special calling to be uh, uh, a youth pastor. It takes a special gifting. I honestly could not do it. Um, and I say that in recognizing it's really, it's God uh, who calls people, who equips people for ministry. I do recognize that, but it, I'm just saying that it, it, just recognizing how God selects really special people to, to be in youth ministry. Um, actually, let me just say the youth ministry is probably something that most resembles the ministry of Jesus. Do you guys know that? You know, we often see images of the 12 disciples as, as uh, these old bearded men, right? But scholars actually have said that, that the disciples could have been uh, at in the age range of as young as 13 years old. 13 years old, can you believe that? Almost my youngest son's age. Uh, and at the most, about 30, 30 years old. So actually, the ministry of Jesus was more like Link and Kaya than ALC. Can you believe it? So I say this to simply ask you, to raise the bar of expectation for yourself as it pertains to ministry, okay? And also, I want to ask you to take time to appreciate, to encourage, and to pray for your pastors, Pastor Dan and Pastor Din, Tim, okay? We are all very fortunate to have them here. Uh, doing all that they do to lead and to teach and to disciple, disciple you so faithfully. Okay? So step up and engage the ministries of Link, uh, as you are, many of you are already doing. Don't just spectate and get in the game. You know, no ministry is perfect. No uh, youth group is perfect. But you show up nonetheless. And, and, and you offer your best for the sake of the collective ministry that we are um, given uh, stewardship over. All right. Okay, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for who you are. May the light of your glory shine upon us today and every day. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for pouring yourself out onto us, into us. Holy Spirit, come. And uh, may we be filled with the, the light and the life and the glory of God today, O oh Lord. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to invite you to open your Bible to the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 24. We're going to read from uh, verse 24 through 26. Let me read it for us. The Gospel of John. Very truly, I tell you, yeah, very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I had the opportunity to talk about this uh, this particular verse, uh, verse 25, last Sunday, and then again, I preached on this, this very message that I, I am uh, delivering to you, um, to your, many of your parents who are members of ALC, uh, today as well, earlier today. So this is a, a repeat. Uh, but I was, I was in the middle of just kind of preparing for the messages, and I was on the, the track of preparing two, two separate messages. Then I realized that it was actually, I was preparing the same messages, just kind of slightly different. So I just combined everything together. And uh, I hope what um, I have 
to bring to you is meaningful to you, that you receive it as, uh, as from the Lord, all right? And uh, so what I want to do before I talk about this, uh, this passage we just read today, I want to give you a little bit of my backstory. We all have backstories, right? Heroes have backstories, um, and I have a backstory, and that's what I want to uh, share with you today. I turn 50 years old this year. Later in October, I'm going to be the big 5-0, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, wow, you're old, right? I know that's what you're thinking. I don't blame you for thinking that because there was a time when I thought 50 was really, really old. I thought it was grandpa age, right? So, um, but you do know, you know, the 50 is the new 30. And I say that because I feel more alive as a 50-year-old than I did when I was, uh, when I was 30 years old. And, uh, as, and the reason for that, there's a reason for that, and I hope that you guys are able to pick up why I say that. And I don't just say it for saying it. Like I feel more alive today than when I was 30 years old. Um, and so, uh, so my backstory. I was born in Korea. I came to the U.S. at age 11. It was me, my younger brother, my mom, and my dad, the four of us. And like many immigrant families who came in the early 1980s, 80s, um, we didn't really have much. Maybe my, my folks had a couple hundred dollars, maybe a thousand dollars, and we had the clothes that we packed into our luggage. You know, you can't bring a lot of stuff in an airplane, right? So. We just came. We just came to the, the States. Um, and thankfully, we did have some relatives. My dad's sisters, older sister, my dad's a magne. Um, and uh, they had come already. Uh, and for the first year or two, maybe a couple of years, we were bouncing around, you know, between, you know, relatives' homes. Um, my father eventually got a job. His very first job was a, 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 as a janitor uh, at Wright Pat Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Vandalia, Ohio is where, where that was. So we, we ended up settling in Ohio. And my mom got a job working as a seamstress in a men's clothing store. It was a, like one of those formal stores where um, they alterate the, the tuxedos. Like, so prom season, things would get really busy. Uh, so that's where she got the job because my aunt work, was working there. So it's about connections in those days, right? So she got a job working as a seamstress there. In the summers, we went uh, on Saturday mornings, um, and then maybe during the week as well, we went to uh, pick uh, strawberries. And not just for us to take home to eat, but pick strawberries, like we were like almost like migrant workers. We we we, we went there. Uh, there was a, a large local farm called Muma Farms. I remember, and uh, we picked the these strawberries and we would put them into these uh, baskets, right? And then we take them over to this truck. And then at the truck was the uh, the field manager. And the field manager's job was to inspect the strawberries to make sure they're the, the right color and the right size. If it's if it's green, or if it's too small, they said, no, we're not going to accept this. So we, we take over the, the, the baskets of strawberries that we picked, and we give them, and they give you, like, cash right away. It's like a couple dollars, right? And then you hand it to you. And, uh, you know, these jobs, they kind of, again, travel uh, by word of mouth, it's family members inviting their relatives, and then these are typically uh, immigrants, right? Low-income uh, people who come, and it's beneficial for the, the farmers because it's cheap labor, right? And I realized that I was doing this, and I was about 13 years old at the time, 
12, 13 years old, um, and it was like probably illegal child labor <laughs> I was doing at the time. So that's what we were doing because it was, it was a, is a quick way to make some money for the family, and then um, it didn't require lots of skills, right? You just go and you pick, you do the, do the work and you get paid. So we did this for some years. Um, we eventually moved out of my aunt's house where we were living at the time. Uh, we moved into our own rental unit. It was a duplex. It's like two-story duplex. And we were on the top, top level, um, two bedrooms. And then a few years later, my parents saved enough money, uh, and we ended up moving to a suburban Inglewood, Ohio. Not Inglewood, California, Inglewood, Ohio. Um, and uh, we, you know, parents saved enough for a down payment on a house, and that was our first home in the States in a nicer kind of neighborhood, right? And so we, I went from mostly black uh, school, all the students, fellow students, the majority were, were black, and then to a school that was majority white, not just majority, but super majority, 95% white. There were very few minorities uh, in, that, in that school. So you guys may appreciate this. You know, I just wanted to fit in. Growing up in the States, as an Asian American, I just wanted to fit in. But because everywhere I went, I was a minority, I ended up really despising the fact that I was Asian, right? I, I hated that I was Asian. I hated the way that I looked, right? I just wanted to belong. And if I look back at my high school years, it, it was, there were so many awkwardness and insecurity that I was really wrestling with. And if I had a time machine, if I would go back, I would talk to my younger self and say, it's okay. You're going to be okay. And so because I don't have a, a time machine, in some ways, I, I'm imagining myself going back to you guys and telling <laughs> whatever you're, you're dealing with, you're going, going through right now, particularly as it relates to identity, all of these uh, insecurities that you're feeling. I just want to say, it's okay. You're going to be okay. Um, some of our uh, dads, we were getting together, we're talking about different things, and one of the things that were coming up is um, the, uh, for the seniors that we have in the church, that you're going to be missing out. You're so much missing out uh, in, because of the pandemic, right? And one of those things is um, your senior prom. You're not going to have that, and, uh, and it's kind of a sad, sad thing that you're to miss out on that. And one of these days, I will share with you my story of my senior prom, okay? It's a sad story, what happened, okay? But I'm not, I don't have time to get into that right now, but um, yeah. So fast forward, at age 19, uh, while I was in college, I met Jesus. It was my uh, born-again experience, moment, right? It was one of those, my heart being strangely warmed like Wesley. I, I felt that, um, that experience. I encountered Jesus, which I'm not going to go into again today. Uh, this encounter with Jesus happened uh, while I was in the midst of this broader search for my identity, trying to figure out who I am, right? Um, and, and Jesus met me in that place. And it was around that time that I also started to embrace my Koreanness, my Asianness, okay? And um, it was around the time right, where like K dramas were beginning in popularity. It's not like the international popularity that it has right now, but among the Korean Americans who were living abroad in the States, right, they, were, they were renting these tapes from their Korean stores, VHS tapes, and they pop it in, they watch it. And uh, there were uh, this dramas that, that watch, and these are like really good-looking Korean people, <laughs> Asian Americans, and say, oh, wow, so we can be attractive too, 
right? Uh, I shared earlier the particular drama to, to your folk parents. If some of your parents know what the drama that I was uh, watching that, I, that really gave me that impression really so strongly how pretty, how cute the, the main actress was. Even if I say it, you guys won't know, so I'm not going to say it. All right. So by this time, I was, uh, I was attending a Korean church near my campus, college campus, and I was with other people who looked like me, who had similar backstories as me. And I finally felt like I was, I was belonging, I, that I belong. You know, you guys um, grow up in the, in the West Coast, right? And especially today, you may not understand or appreciate the experience of those of us who grew up in the Midwest. And not just Midwest, but uh, the South Midwest, the Southern Ohio Midwest, okay? So we were right on the border in Dayton, Cincinnati. That's where I was. Um, and it was right above the Mason-Dixon line, okay? So right a few miles south of us was Kentucky, right? And so there weren't a lot of us there like it is on the East Coast or West Coast or even Chicago, uh, which eventually I would move, up, move to Chicago. But um, so when we were moving over here, one of the things that we were looking at different schools, right? which neighbor do we uh, move into? Um, and so looking at different schools, and, said, and they said that North County schools are really good. You have Westview, you have Mount Carmel, you have Poway, all of those schools that are pretty good. So we, we, had, a, we had to pick which one that our kids would, would go into. And then we ended up ultimately deciding Westview. Westview, who? Anybody Westview? <laughs> um, so, and the reason why we selected, one of the things that I was doing, and my kids didn't care, but I, one of the, the, when you go on to niche.com or those greatschools.com, they give you a breakdown of the demographics, right? So one of the things that I looked at, first thing that I looked at is, okay, what's the breakdown of Asians versus other groups? And, and I think what I saw was that Westview had the most greater, greatest percentage of uh, Asians. So that's one of the key reasons why we ended up going to the Westview. Um, and uh, we, we selected and moved into the, the, the home in there. And we were renting a house. And of course, we can't afford to buy, buy a home there. So that's what, that's what happened. So for me, it was like a big deal. Even when uh, we were living in Chicago area, we were in suburban, and so our kids were still... Even in this, in 2020 and 2021, um, it's not like here, all right? They grew up uh, for the past eight, nine years in, in a majority Anglo kind of a community. So they were still, my kids also were sort of minorities in um, where they were before we moved here, right? So that, for me, that was kind of an important thing, and uh, I wanted them to be a part of a um, an Asian, a larger community of, of Asian Americans. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, it's because my immigrant experience shaped my values and purpose. And in the early 1990s, these values uh, intersected with my newly forming Christian identity. And so I, I cannot under, understate the positive impact of the belonging that I found in my Korean American community, Asian community, had on the development of my Christian identity and discipleship. They somehow beautifully intersected uh, in my early years of Christian formation after I met Jesus personally. Um, so it played a key role. So I loved being in the church. Just like some of you guys know what I'm talking about, right? I loved being in the church. I practically lived in the church. I ate. <laughs> we cooked ramen and, and, and ate kimchi at the, uh, at the church. And, and we would have sleepovers and lock-ins. And, and I did everything that you could do, including cleaning toilets, you know, Sunday school teacher, youth group teacher, president of the young adult group. I did everything, praise team, worship team. I did all, everything. 
I loved it. I loved my life. But it was also uh, my Asian American community that told me that all of us growing up as 1.5 generation, second generation, third generation Korean American, we, uh, we have very limited options on what you should do in terms of your career. Right? You guys all know what I'm talking about, right? Doctor, lawyer, engineer. Those were the three options that were available to me. And, and I bought it. And I, I, I believed it. And that's, I felt like I want to do one of those things. I want to be successful. It's my dream, my goal. I wanted to do all those things. And then it really uh, was bolstered by the fact that I was surrounded with very highly successful people who achieved a lot in their life. They've achieved the American dream. They were living the American dream. Okay? And to boot, these were faithful Christians. They, they were serving in the church um, and uh, it's just like they seem to have, have it all. They seem to have the perfect, perfect life. And I said, yeah, that's what I want. I want that. I want that for me. And then the way that I justified it was, was this. I used to believe that the motivation, my motivation for success and, uh, was really this growing up and uh, watching my parents suffer and sacrifice. Okay, and, and in some ways that they pinned their hopes, they went all in on us, right? They poured into our lives to make sure that we can get the education, that we can get the stuff that we need for us to be successful. They, they pinned their hopes and their dreams on us. And because I was a good son, I was a firstborn, I was a, I was a jangnam, okay? And I, I, I appreciated their sacrifice for us, that I thought that I would become successful and then that I would take care of them. So that's what I thought my motivation was that gave me justification uh, in terms of really trying to work hard to achieve the certain level of success. And that kind of tried, that motivated me, right? But then I realized in truth, it wasn't so much that there was an aspect of that. There was, a, there was an element of that, right? That it wasn't so much that I wanted to bless my parents, but really, in reality, I just didn't want to be like my parents. I didn't want to be like my parents. My dad, in his life uh, in the States, he took on all kinds of different jobs, one of them was a, uh, a cook at a couple of Chinese restaurants. He would go and, and he would work there. So he was a cook. And what, right around the time when I was finishing up college, he decided to, to really take a step up to the next level. And he decided to uh, buy a small takeout Chinese restaurant. There were tables inside. Um, but it was more, more of a takeout place. And, uh, and he's, my dad's very frugal. He's very disciplined in, with his finances. So he saved some, enough money. Then he ended up putting his entire life savings into this business. This was his very first time running, running a business. Well, after about a year and a half, he had to close the business. Why? Because he just wasn't making enough to cover the rent and all of the other expenses. So he lost everything. All of his savings, poof, gone. He ended up getting a job at a cleaning company. And they cleaned offices at night when all the office workers go, that he would go and uh, clean the offices. And so this job, uh, this office building, um, this contractor was near my school, my college. And so he ended up coming in and living with me in my studio apartment. By that time, I was out of the dorms. I was living in my own. It was very dirty. It had 
cockroaches and everything. Um, it, was, it was a dirty, dirty apartment, studio apartment. Um, I had my bed, desk, and then there was a couch. And I offered my bed, but he refused to sleep on the bed. So he would scrunch up on, on the couch and he would sleep. That's where he would sleep. And then I, that image of him sleeping on the couch is just burned and seared into my mind, even today. And I think about sometimes my father's life, his hopes and his dreams. Like any of us, I imagine that, that he had a dream for his own life. But things didn't go according to what he had imagined. My father was, was a good father. He, he loved us. He sacrificed. Um, and he was such a hard worker. He didn't, he didn't gamble money. He didn't, he, didn't, uh, he didn't do any of the stuff that was irresponsible. But for whatever reason, life was hard for him. He must have had dreams. And part of me wanted to take that on, right, the responsibility, because he poured into my life so much. I wanted to pay him back in certain ways. That there was a part of me that wanted to do that. But if I'm being honest, a greater part of me simply just didn't want to be like my dad. Always struggling. I was not ungrateful. I was mindful of the sacrifice. And I appreciated it, right? But if I'm honest, I was more motivated by my own selfish ambitions shaped by the cultural forces around me, what I was seeing all around. That's what I want. I don't want this right here. I want that. That was what, what was really driving me, if I'm truly being honest. The thing is this. I had this nagging feeling <laughs> very early in my 20s that uh, I was being called to ministry, which was affirmed by the people around me, especially my mentors, people who discipled me, taught me. I had really good mentors. And uh, they sensed it too. But they didn't, they didn't say, you got to do this, you got to do that. But they knew but I didn't want to become a pastor. I didn't want to become a pastor. And I go to these mission trips, right? Uh, I remember, not too far from here, I realized all, after all these years, we would go to mission trips to San Simon in Baja, California. Um, Del Cordero Mission was what it is. It was like a mission, more of a training center where, we, where these young people, college people would go in the summers and then, we, there was a missionary. Missionary Nam was there. He was he trained uh, these young people. There were but people from Berkeley. I remember there were students from Stanford and, and UCLA and Cal. All these places, these students would come. These young, good-looking uh, Christian young men and women. They uh, um, and they would come, and there would be altar calls, and there would be all sorts of people just kind of pouring themselves out, and then many of them committing to the Lord. And I said. Lord, please, do not, do not call me to be a pastor. I, I'm happy to come, and, and I come on these mission trips and serve you and, and serve faithfully in the church, and I want to be like, you know, my uncle, like our uncle, who's a, who's a dentist, right, and, and who does, a, does great work, gives back so much to the church, and, and does this life, and, and that's what I want. Don't call me to become a pastor. And so I resisted, I resisted, I resisted. My entire 20s, I resisted. 
And guess what? I was miserable. I was miserable in my 20s. I'm not saying it was all bad. There were moments. You know, I met my, my wife, Hannah, in my 20s. We dated and we got married uh, when I was 28. And then after uh, a little over a year, uh, we got married. We had our first child. Um, and Sam, and I don't know if you guys met him, but um, we ambitiously built our brand new home from, from ground up, right? I didn't build it, but we had builders build it, but it's suburban Cincinnati. I got a, you know, a corporate job, you know, she was working as a physical therapist, and, and we were living the dream, right? We were, we were moving toward fulfilling our American dream. And that's how we kind of, I, I concluded my 20s. But I had resisted, up until this point, God's call over my life. Two years into my marriage, I could not resist any longer. I hit a, a wall in my life, at my work. And it was impossible. It was impossible for me to go on with my life at that point. So long story short, I reluctantly dropped everything, and then I entered seminary, and I said, God, you know, I'm going to try this thing out, go into seminary, uh, but I just know that it's not really for me, but so if, if I try this and I figure that it's not for me, then I'm just going to come back, okay, just do something, whatever, okay, okay, God? So that was the beginning of my 20 years in ministry. Right, so age 30 to now almost 50, 20 years of ministry. Um, there was a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, especially for my wife in those 20 years. Lots of rejection, lots of fear, lots of I wouldn't say lot, but humiliation. Um, you know, you can say in some ways these are all necessary part of your development and your growth and your maturity. You learn through failure. You, you learn through rejection. All of these things are, are necessary, part of our growth. But my point is this. All of these things could have been experienced much earlier in my life. So I was going through these, these painful learning experiences in my 30s and my 40s when I have young kids all around, running around. I have four kids, by the way. Rather than going through most of it in my 20s when I knew God was calling me. Now, some of that learning stuff, I basically ended up delaying Later, And then it, it resulted in, I think, greater suffering for the people around me because of the, the pain of the lessons learned uh, during these uh, years rather than earlier. You know, not everybody is called to be a pastor. And that's not what this message is about, Right? Not everybody's called to be a pastor. We all have different vocations, different callings. Some are called to be doctors, some are called to be engineers, some are called to be musicians, some are called to be artists. I was called to be a pastor. But I didn't like that because I had my own plan and my own ideas against what God has intended for me. In retrospect, you know, it was an early call, but, you know, I, um, it was clouded, the calling that I received earlier on by my own ambition and uh, um, my rejection of God's plan and will over my life. 
So that's the question that I want to give to you. I want you to think about this as you're listening to my story, is what are some ways that God is speaking to you and God has revealed his heart to you and will for you, but that you're just kind of pushing God to the side and rejecting and said, no, not interested. Throughout our lives, God comes to us and, and, and speaks to us, reveals his heart to us, but we shun him away. And I want you to think about that, where you might be in that, uh, in that way in, in your own life. If I had surrendered to the will of God uh, for my life earlier, I think I would have uh, saved a lot of heartache and suffering, unnecessary heartache and suffering in the seasons that I've experienced it, which made it even more difficult. Right? There are some lessons that I won't go into that, um, that I've learned in my 30s and in my 40s, that stuff that I may have, I, might, I would have just kind of learned earlier, much earlier. So if we look at the text again, John chapter uh, 12, verse 24, um, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, unless the grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. If it, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. So if you took high school biology, you know that Jesus is, when he's talking about a seed dying and bearing fruit, he's probably th- talking about a seed entering in, into this this period of dormancy, right, during which it doesn't do anything. It just sits there as if it was dead. So most likely that's what he's talking about here. But then what happens? After this period of death or dormancy, at a certain time it germinates and then sprouts and then grows and and eventually bears lots and lots of fruit. So you guys learned that in biology, right? So that's what he's talking about. So he's saying this to illustrate the point. The core biblical truth is that life, true life, comes after death. That's what he's saying here. What is the ultimate example of that? That true life comes after death? The death and resurrection of Jesus himself, right? Through his death and resurrection, we also die with him and we rise with him at his resurrection and we receive the gift of eternal life, death, and then life. This is the core message of, of the uh, Gospels, right, um, that, that Jesus is really portraying here in what he's teaching here. Building on that, we've heard Jesus said, say this, right? If you want to become my followers, this is from Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. He says, if you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily. What is the cross? It's the instrument of death. Cross is the instrument of death. So what he's saying, you've got to die every day and follow me. To follow Jesus requires death. He says, verse 24, for those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. That's what he says. And in today's passage, John chapter um, 12, right? Um, <clears throat> verse, uh, verse 25, he says it in a slightly different way than in Luke's gospel. He says this. He says, those who love their life will lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will save it for eternal life. Can you give the, put, project that slide up there? Because we need to kind of track this because it's, we can kind of miss the, the details here, all right? And uh, so let's, let's do this. Let's do some word study because in English it's very confusing because there's repetition of words, but these words don't mean the same thing, okay? But if you read it on the surface, it's very, very confusing. What, what does Jesus mean? What is he talking about? Well, let's look at the word love, the first occurrence of the word love, those who love their life. This word love is the Greek word phileo, okay? You guys have all heard of a... Uh, there's different words for love, right, in the Greek, right? And you guys are most familiar with the word agape, which is the sacrificial, deep love of God, infinite, eternal love of God. That's agape love, the sacrificial love. That's um, what we're talking about. This word is not, this is word uh, is not agape, but this is 
phileo, which means um, friendship kind of love, or uh, fondness, or uh, attachment. Okay? It's attachment kind of a thing. It's, uh, it's love of a brother in Philadelphia, right? Um, and, and then, those who love their life, the word life here is also interesting because there's r- different words for this word life, the English word life. And the word here that Jesus uses is the word uh, suke. It's the, it's the root word where you get the word psychology from. So the life that he's talking about is, is the, uh, sometimes it's translated as soul or ego or personality or preference, okay? So what is he saying? Those who are really, really attached to, their, to padding their egos, to insisting upon their, their own preferences, things that they have, have figured is important to them and they do whatever they can to, to attain those things, that's what he's talking about. He said, when you spend your life loving and pursuing and being attached to those things, those external things often, right? That the things that you think are bringing you happiness, these things, if you keep pursuing those things, you're going to actually end up losing the real stuff, the real life, okay? And then he says, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The word hate is also, the way we hear it, it's, it's a very emotional word, Right? But that's not so much emotional, uh, emotions attached to this word. It's really about what this word means is to detach, to denounce, to surrender, to separate. That's what this word means. Miseo is the Greek word. Okay? And then there's the word life again, suke. So those preferences, our, our sort of uh, ambitions, and that our ego, uh, our... Um, things that make us like, behave a certain way, our personalities, that's what that is. So those who are able to separate themselves from things that stroke your ego, right? then those people will be able to keep their life for eternal life. Okay? And then the last word, it's the word, English word life, but it's different in the, in the Greek. It's the word zoe. Zoe. Zoe life is the abundant, infinite life of God. Right? So you're trading, you're trading this finite, uh, temporary, uh, ego-driven life that, that we accumulate over time as we're living in this world, you're trading that for a life that, that is infinite, that doesn't end, that is vast, that is abundant, this life of God. In some ways, you can replace it for uh, heaven, right? The life of God, heaven. So this is, this is the trade-off that Jesus is inviting us to. Um, my life, my 20s, and I share this to you, you know, I'm quite a bit older than most of you guys who are listening to this, and this is my sort of, I'm just now realizing and learning this, understanding this, okay? My 20s, which many of you, once you graduate, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're reaching 20, my son, my oldest son is turning 20 in a couple of days. And uh, for me, as I look back, my 20s were kind of characterized by bondage to this suke life, ego-driven, preferential, self-focused life. And I was slave to that. And in some way, that the way that it worked out was it was in rebellion to God's heart and God's purpose and will for my life. I was a slave to my suke life. And then, in my 30s and 40s, was this wilderness life that I was in. 
I responded to the call, the invitation for, for me to come out. I spent it in the wilderness. Just like the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years, well, mine was 20 years of wilderness where it was a place of purification. It was a place of learning the key message that I'm hearing again and again today is the message of how to surrender. I didn't want to let go. I didn't want to surrender because I was reluctant followers. I said, oh, I want to go back to Egypt. Even as I was doing ministry, right? Even as I was a pastor, I was like, I don't know if I want this. I, I, I want to, let me just go back to Egypt. And then as I'm about to turn 50, I feel like I'm on the cusp of the promised land. Like this eternal life, this Zoe life that God is inviting me into. It took me this many years to, to learn, learn this. Almost 30 years. No, almost 40 years. Yeah, 40 years to realize this. And I share this with you as if I am traveling back in time to my younger self, if I were to share my, the message. I can't do that. So what's the next best thing is for me to share with you. And, uh, and you may hear this. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you, you've done everything, and, 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 and it was, you're, you turned out fine, right? So what, what's the difference? Here's one, one thing that I want you to, to recognize. Um, this mentality of YOLO, right? You only live once, so you just kind of live it up. That message is just all around us. You got to live it up, and it's, it's, it's a message that even penetrates into Christians, Christian uh, young people's heart because oftentimes the message is so strong, the culture, cultural message is so strong that... that the stuff that is out there is just so enticing, uh, so pleasurable. That's the message you're receiving, so you got to do it. It's so, it's so pretty to the eyes, right? It's very attractive to the eyes, so we just got to go, and then maybe eventually I'll come back. And that's what happens a lot of times. Young people, this generation of people, they, they leave. They, they totally, they grow up in the church, and they leave the church, they live up the life, whatever, and then they eventually, when they start having kids, they come back. That's, and then some, some come back, others just don't come back at all, right? But here's the thing. Pastor, you've, uh, you've kind of wandered, and, well, it seems like everything's, uh, everything's fine with you. Everything's not fine with me. One thing that I want to really, really make sure that you guys hear, hear me out on this is you become what you behold. What you take in, what you practice doing over and over again, that, that's part of you. No amount of praying will get rid of that, that stuff, the mess that you, you accumulate over your life of repetition and practice. So like if you're addicted to lust, if you're addicted to greed, if you're addicted to anger, yes, we are saved by grace. God accepts you. God receives you and forgives you. By the grace of God, we are saved. But the stuff that we accumulate throughout our lives, that doesn't go away. And it's a it's a constant struggle. So this is a thing that I couldn't understand when I was younger. Right? Why can't you just do what you want and then ask God for forgiveness? Yes, if you, if you, by grace of God, God is ever merciful and compassionate. But what I have found is, is a daily struggle. The patterns in which we, we devote ourselves, invest our time and energy, that that's becomes a part of you, and it's, it's going to be a continual struggle. And the thing is, we don't know if we're going to have tomorrow. We don't know when our life will end here on earth. We think we have 20 years, 30 years. Who knows? 
I'm reminded of, um, recently we talked about the situation with Ravi Zacharias, the famed apologist, right? You guys know, heard about what happened to him, right? This guy who was, um, who was just renowned, very eloquent, articulate apolo- Christian apologist who had a secret life, the stuff that he was just harboring and hanging on to. And he, he carried it with him for so long to the point where he just could not help himself, right? And he ended up abusing and hurting so many people. And then, to my knowledge, he didn't repent. He didn't own up to his, his sins and mistakes, even to his deathbed. Nobody knew. Everybody, it was after his death that uh, things were found out. I have no idea where, where Ravi Zacharias is and what his re- true relationship with Jesus was. So what I'm saying is, 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 is this. We don't know. We don't know how much time we have. Sin destroys. There's no guarantee that we'll ever find our way back to God if we allow ourselves to wander away. But the temptation is, is so great among all of us, particularly those of you guys who grew up in the church, right? You, you become cultural Christians. And there's nothing more powerless than being cultural Christians. You just kind of, by osmosis, you take it in. It's just, you do this, and you think that's the true stuff. That's the real stuff. No. It gives you the illusion that you're okay. But what happens is, I see so many young people being lured away. Lured away. And then they, we, we uh, put, compartmentalize God and, and put him into this box and then just kind of access, access God whenever we need it while we have this, all this other stuff going on. So this is, uh, this is my invitation for, uh, by the way, at, in closing, I'm going to offer dating advice, okay? So hang on for that. I need to get your attention for a little bit. So dating advice, I'll close with the dating advice. Um, and uh, so here, here is the thing. We, we are tempted to normalize sin um, in our lives and uh, because FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. We want to go out and, and experience these things. Um, but f- here, uh, Jesus says this. Jesus says that uh, whoever uh, serves me must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Whoever serves me, my father will honor. The thing that I was longing for, desiring for, is this place of honor. Place of honor. But it only comes after we surrender. It's on the other side of surrender. Life is on the other side of surrender. When we relinquish and trust, because we truly believe God is who he says he is. We believe it with all of our hearts. We're able to trust him that God knows better than we do. I didn't trust him. And then it led to all sorts of painful, painful time in the wilderness to help me at age 50 to realize missed opportunities. So let me close with this. I don't know if any of you guys are surfers. Any surfers here in this sanctuary? Any surfers going surfing? Found out that Danny Cha is a surfer, so I'm going to ask him to take me out. Pastor Dan, are you a surfer? A little bit. I'd love to go out because it really, I want to really experience this uh, lesson, this final lesson for myself. Um, the difference between suke and zoe, the, the, the life, okay, is between the wave and the ocean. Suke 
is like the wave on the ocean. So it, you, you get on a surfboard and it's, it's fun and it's exciting. It's, at times it seems it's exhilarating, right? So like the tiny small waves, guess what? The nature of these tiny small waves, what is it? It's impermanent. So one small wave rise up and then it's gone, right? That's our life on this earth, okay? Versus Zoe life is like if you go in, if you somehow, God gives you the ability to breathe under the ocean. If you go in, inside, what happens? When the waves are coming and big old waves come and then crash into them, destroying and wiping out the smaller waves, and it's chaotic, right? People are screaming for life, and it's a dangerous, scary, scary thing. But even when the, the waves are going on up on top, if you go deeper into the ocean, what is it? It's a calm. It's peace. It's vast. That's what Zoe life is like. It's a place of weightlessness. Right? You're, you're simply floating because God has set you free from all the shackles, all of the, uh, the bondages that, uh, and then just being to- to- tossed to and fro, which my, most of my life has been just being tossed back and forth, being beat up, because I was insisting upon the suke, the small waves. But God's invitation for all of us, and this is a symbol of baptism too, when you're immersed in the, into the water, Right? You are immersed into this vast ocean of God's love and God's peace. This is the invitation. What is it that you are hearing? This is the truth of God. But for many, we, we, we end up settling, settling for the, the waves where it's just one minute it's there, it's gone. So my invitation to each of you today, and I've been talking for a long time, um, is to hear this invitation, not as a, a kind of, we hear it sometimes as a punishment, right? Deny yourself. Deny yourself and take up the cross. The invitation to die seems like, Man, you're asking us to sacrifice. But no, it's invitation to true life, real life. So let me finish with the dating advice. I have four kids. I have four kids. None of them, including my 20-year-old uh, son, who's going to be 20 in a few days, have actually ever been in any sort of relationship. And I just sense that God is preserving them and protecting them. Um, and uh, here's what I would tell them, and I want to tell you, you guys, okay? So I know you guys think about these things. I don't know. For some reason, my girls and my kids, they don't, they don't really think, <laughs> think about this a whole lot. Um, but here's what I want you to do as one of the pastors in here in the church, what you look for in your potential mate the ones you enter into a relationship. Simply this. Get into a relationship with somebody who knows the difference between suke and zoe. Okay? Right? I want you to think about that, why, why that is. The difference between suke and zoe. Amen. we close in prayer, Pastor Dan, or, yeah, um, let's see, okay, so uh, can we have, uh, let's, let's spend, I want to lead uh, us into a time frame, can we have some music, a BGM, and uh, I appreciate you guys really taking time to uh, hear me out. <laughs> Thank you for um, Pastor 
Dan and Pastor Tim extending the invitation to come, for me to come to speak to you. And um, I hope that you guys can hear my heart. And uh, let's, uh, let's spend, spend this time in just kind of reflecting and re responding to what you've heard uh, this uh, afternoon. Let's search your hearts and search your life right now. In what ways has God been nudging you, speaking to you? And in what ways have you sort of push that off to the side. You weren't really having uh, any of it because you, you know what you want. You have different motivations for why that is. I just know that the influence of this world, the, the propaganda of this world is so great, so overwhelming, that it's so hard to resist the temptation. To let go and just move away from whatever it is that God is uh, saying to you so that you can just go out and, and, and ride the waves of your preference and ego. But today, Jesus offers this invitation for all that who have ears to hear. Hear this invitation. If you want to follow me, take up your cross and deny yourself every day. That if you try to save your suke life, there's a distinct possibility you'll lose your true life. But if you are willing to surrender and let go of your desire to control your own life, to simply surrender and uh, trust in the power of God, purpose of God, the plan of God for your life, I guarantee that you will receive the gift of eternal life. This is a promise of Jesus. Will we spend the life pursuing the next thrill that just so fading where we receive the invitation to the Zoe life the life that never runs out the life of weightlessness fullness the peace and the life of God Lord, grant us your Holy Spirit. Give us the ability to trust you, first and foremost. Trust in what you say so that we might surrender to you. We know that, that you have great and wonderful things planned for us. That you do have a, pro a plan to prosper us. Bless us, O oh Lord, so that we might participate with you in the work and the ministry of bringing people to the Zoe life. So Lord, would you empower us today that we might bow before you, surrender ourselves fully to you, trust in you, and turn over our lives to you once again. Yes, Lord. Holy Spirit, come. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Your will 
be done. And your will be done in our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
CONVAP for juniors and seniors. Please sign up so we know who's going to join us. Easter Sunday, the, the filling out form is on our website, so please fill it out. Um, I think that is all. And we're going to open up the breakout rooms right now for small group. It is a little late, but just come in, say hello, and then um, we can just go about our ways on this Sunday. But yes, join your small groups, see each other's faces, and then we'll call it good. All right. Thanks, guys. Good pause. Hello. Sarah, your AirPods connected to my phone. Your AirPods connected to my phone. Where's the Zoom? Where's the Zoom? Just or I'm just the website. This is the website. Yesterday, like I woke, I paid a disability for like a mock ACT, and like it was literally like I was even off for like four hours of sleep. So I was like, if I'm waking up this early, I better like fucking prove. And, like, and like I didn't prove, so I feel like I did a little bit. 